Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. For today's ism on Ism Tuesday, I'd like for us to consider uh, an ism that's probably not especially tempting uh, for any of you. And so I'm thinking I should probably speak a little bit more positively than negatively uh, to see what's uh, why Christians have found this something positive through the decades or rather through the centuries. The ism I'd like us to consider is monasticism monasticism. And let's start by speaking, I'm not sure whether we call it bad or good, about the church. Where did monasticism come from? Monasticism is uh, the practice of uh, living separate lives, separate physically, of uh, coming away from the broader culture to live in isolation for the purpose of uh, service to the kingdom and growth spiritually. That tells us something about the beginning or the founding of this movement, because here's what happened. What happened was that during the, uh, up until Constantine, Christians were uh, almost always in danger of being put to death for their faith, which tended to, you know, uh, sift out those who were soft or weak in their faith. Uh, if you were a Christian prior to Constantine, then it took some courage. But when Constantine did the blessed thing and converted the Roman Empire to Christianity and uh, created the Edict of Milan, which legalized Christianity, all of a sudden there became social reasons to be a part of the church. And the church was a place where one might succeed in the world by being a part of it. And so it attracted a lot of soft professing Christians. The monastics were those who seeing that thought, you know, we want a more zealous Christianity. We want a more committed Christianity. We want a Christianity so separate from that pursuit of success that we're going to go off by ourselves and we're going to create these monasteries. Now, I understand that desire for something more when the church is particularly weak and watered down. Uh, however, two things. One, it's a very dangerous game to try to create a two-tiered Christianity. There is no second blessing. In fact, if there was a second blessing, it, was, it would be realizing there is no second blessing. That doesn't mean there aren't things that are good for our spiritual growth. Of course there are. But there's no secret. And secondly, bringing us back to the first one in a sense, even if there were, this one's not in the Bible. Nothing in the Bible says to do this, to separate from the broader culture, to live in isolation. That ought to be a clue. Hey, you know, this brilliant idea we came up with is a brilliant idea we came up with. Well, let me say a few good things about the monastics. One, the monastics, uh, in God's good providence, were able to uh, maintain and uh, protect a great deal of ancient wisdom through their practice of copying and through their isolation, uh, they were able to um, pretty well avoid the destruction that came with the barbarian hordes at the beginning of the Dark Ages and the end of the Roman Empire. Uh, they were sort of uh, almost like a group of people in a bomb shelter. Uh, and they were able to preserve things that would not have been preserved if they were not there. And that's a positive thing. They were zealous for the kingdom of God, and that's a positive thing. And ironically, 
They were often profoundly evangelistic. They would, just like we have in our day, the church planting movement, though, of course, the difference is the church is in the Bible. Uh, when we have churches that church plant, that plant churches, that plant churches, that plant churches, well, that was often the case for monasteries. They would hive off and create new groups time and time again. And they actually preserve not just knowledge from the ancient world, but in a very real sense, they preserve Christianity and ultimately were powerful in being used by God to bring those barbarian hordes into the kingdom of God. It's a messy story, I'll grant you, but the solution is not to just look at those people in the monasteries and say, oh, well, they were evil. They were the devil. They were awful. Or they were the only good ones. There's good and bad everywhere you look. So monasticism in our day is something more akin to what the Amish uh, contend to do. And again, in terms of praise, the good news for that, that kind of approach is... Uh, there's a pushback against the world. There's a, hey, I, I'm not just like my neighbor. I am set apart. I am distinct. I have been called to be holy. My values and my motives are not the same as my unbelieving neighbors. And my lifestyle, therefore, doesn't look exactly like theirs. We could use a lot of that. So much of the message in the Christian church is out to the world. Hey, we're not so different from you. We just add Jesus. We're j you're so close. All you need is a little Jesus. Yeah, that's not so good. What we need is people who are sold out enough to the kingdom of God that they could handle being isolated, but who were so submissive to the word of God that instead of retreating, they advance. The devil, who is more crafty than any beast of the field, doesn't especially care whether we believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. Indeed, I'd suggest that it's conceivable that he might be more frightened of person A, who doesn't affirm the inerrancy of Scripture, than person B who affirms it. The power of the Bible isn't that it is a book that is true. The power is in the truth of what is in the Bible. The power is in the truths, not the truthfulness. Imagine person A never heard of inerrancy and so can't affirm it. Suppose person A was badly taught and came to believe that the Bible taught geocentrism, that the earth is the center of the universe. And suppose person A believes geocentrism is wrong. Now suppose person A reads the account of Adam and Eve, and he comes to believe that his first parents fell from the estate wherein they were created that God promised to deliver them from death through the promised seed of the woman. Suppose he believes that God's deliverance, not just of Adam and Eve, but of Noah, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, all demonstrate God's faithfulness to deliver his people and all point to the coming deliverer. Suppose person A believes he can best love God and his neighbor by submitting himself to the law of God. Suppose he sees himself in the Psalms, even as he sees Jesus in the Psalms. Suppose he believes that Paul's commands to husbands and wives are true and come from the very breath of God. 
Suppose he believes that Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. Suppose he believes that true religion is in visiting widows and orphans in their trouble, and so labors to do so. Now, imagine person B, a champion of an errancy. Suppose, however, that person B was also badly taught and came to believe that the Bible's account of the creation is poetic, true in a mythic sense, but not actual history. Suppose he believes a devastating local flood took place in the days of Noah. Suppose he finds the accounts of the patriarchs, true accounts of interesting people who lived in a distant land in a distant time, but who have little to do with us. Suppose he believes that the law of God given in the Old Testament was for a different era, for a different people. Suppose he believes the Old Testament tells the story about one people of God who are different from the Gentile people of God. Suppose he believes that Paul's commands are culturally conditioned, true in the sense that it is what he called them to do in their context, but would wish differently in our context. Suppose he believes that because Jesus is love, that judgment is not something we need to fear. Suppose he believes that visiting widows and orphans in their trouble is just law designed to show our failure and drive us to Christ. Suppose he considers actually calling believers to visit widows and orphans in their trouble to be incipient legalism. Please don't understand. Inerrancy is both true and vitally important. It is a grave thing indeed to doubt the word of God. But what I'm suggesting, what I'm arguing, is that it is a graver thing still to affirm that the Bible is God's word and then dismiss it or parts of it. Isn't it just possible that we have been manning the barricades of inerrancy while the devil has been undermining the content of the Bible, finding ways to slip through our defenses. The Bible is not God's word because it is true. It is true because it is God's word, which means we need to know Indeed, to believe what it says. It tells us who we are, who God is, how we will relate, and what will happen. And that's just in the first three chapters. The devil-horned, snarling theological liberals have relevantized themselves into irrelevancy. But beware of the smiling, friendly, cunning, theological liberals. They are the dangerous and seductive ones. And they may just be sitting in the pew next to you. Wonder isn't merely the knowledge that God is great. And we are small. It is instead the joyous embracing of this truth. It is curiosity about this great gap. Seeing it not as something to resent, 
but something to celebrate, to play in. Consider snow. That's right. Snow. Where I live, we are in the midst of what is certainly the longest steady period of snow on the ground in the four and a half years that I've been here, and I am grateful for it. But I'm now an adult, and adults tend to see snow one way, while children see snow in a completely different way. An adult homeowner may see work and danger and expense. Commuters tend to trudge through the snow hunched over, trying to bury their heads in their chests. Children, they see it completely differently. Have you ever seen their eyes as they look out the window watching snow fall? When children walk through the snow, they walk with their faces toward the sky, their tongues hanging out, hoping to catch a flake. Adults sigh when they see snow. Children gasp for joy. Snow is the ultimate marriage of complexity in harmony. Billions upon billions of unique notes fall together in a crescendo of white unity. If you should ever be blessed to be far enough away from the cacophony of civilization when a heavy snow falls, you can even hear the very music of the iced dews delicate descent. It is the repainting of a landscape in a thousand hues of white. It is the dance of the wind. It is as if, just for a time, we get to one enter the wonder of Narnia or of Middle Earth to dance amidst the miracle of liquid manna. Indeed, when the snow begins to fall, I imagine God as a sort of celestial Tom Bombadil, walking and whistling through his heavens, reaching deep into his pockets for fistfuls of joy to drop on his creation. In snow, we see the extravagance of creation, remembering again that God made the universe for his glory. Creation, after all, must have been a plenty cool thing. The angels, I'm sure, took their seats with a level of anticipation we can only imagine as they waited for the curtain to go up. God said, let there be light. And there was light. That must have been something. The radiance broke forth and the heavenly chorus sang glory. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsprouljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.